Yay. Hi, uh, thank you, and I'm glad to be here. This is my second LCA, and it's fun to be back. Um, today, I, well, last year uh, when I was here in Canberra, I talked about Swift in kind of a general perspective, uh, and there's been a lot of active development uh, during this year, including one major new feature that's been asked for, for since the beginning of this Swift, and that is global clusters. That's specifically what I'm going to talk about today. But just to get a little feel for who knows what, um, how many people don't know anything about what Swift is? Do not know anything about how Swift works or what it's. OK, well, that's good, because that means we can go pretty quickly through just an overview. I'll, I'll cover it just to make sure we're all on the same pace, page, but we'll go a little more quickly on that. So like I said, my name is John Dickinson. You can find me online, uh, not my name, on um, most places like Freenode and Twitter and places like that. So my vision for Swift is that everyone every day uses Swift whether they realize it or not. And this is something that I think we're actually fairly well on our way to achieving. And the reason I think that, the reason that I want everyone every day to use Swift whether they realize it or not is because I truly believe Swift is storage made for the web. And if you're using the web and you're using storage that's consumed generally through uh, web mobile devices, online, uh, even public or private cloud uh, applications, you should be speaking the Swift API. And we've done a lot of really good stuff along those lines. There's lots and lots of deployments, everything from major cloud service providers to lots of private clouds, everything from uh, back office things, one of which I'll talk about uh, here today, um, to things like Wikipedia and mobile gaming and video streaming and things like this. So it's really great. But one of the things that is a, has been a feature, no longer, but it has been a feature blocking us from seeing this vision realized is the lack of global cluster support. And so that is what we're going to talk about today. I'll cover a little bit about how Swift works and a little bit of background of where we came from, and then specifically cover what the need is and then how we solved that, and then wrap up hopefully with a little short demo and then have, uh, if we have any time left, a little bit of a few questions. So a little background to start with. I think it's very important to make sure we all kind of are, are on the same, same starting page. So first, what is the reason for being for Swift? The reason for being for Swift is the fact that storage access patterns have changed and storage needs have changed as the world has grown and people become more connected and people are using more data, expect more data portability, and our devices are actually getting smaller. So if you try to solve this in a, uh, in a kind of a incremental perspective, you, you start with a single hard drive, then you start with adding in a couple of hard drives tied together, and then you start getting into some pain. Uh, what happens when you have a dozen hard drives and you try to put those into RAID volumes? What happens when you have three dozen hard drives in a single RAID volume? And it just, how do you end up doing this? And the result is you end up with these siloed data access patterns. And it sure, wouldn't, it sure would be nice if you could have a way to abstract those storage volumes and that implementation of the actual storage media so that you can, from your application, not have to worry about, well, what silo it is, is it in and how do I shard it across this and what happens if I have hardware failures and things like that. So Swift's purpose is to stand in the middle there and to be a system for storage such that you have a heterogeneous deployment of storage media hard drives, other things, and different size hard drives, hard drives that may no longer be there because they failed. And so as time changes, you want, as, as you grow, as uh, hardware changes, as your uh, requirements change, you need to be able to grow with that and have a storage system that can both remain durable and available uh, throughout your needs. And the really cool thing is about this is that we know that storage is changing all the time. Everything from you know, 30, 40 years ago, you're looking at cassette tapes that you're actually storing programs on, to newer things like even stuff coming up like memristors and stuff like that. So it's really important that we're able to uh, grow and have a way to abstract these store this storage implementation from uh, the application. And Swift is what does that. So there's a few uh, key things we need to know about Swift when we're talking about Swift. The first thing I want to talk about is a proxy. We use this word a lot, and it is a, a significant component of 
uh, what makes up a Swift cluster. The proxy inside of Swift does a few things. Primarily, it implements most of the Swift API, but also secondarily, it coordinates the communication with all of the backend storage nodes. And the nice thing about this is because the proxy is what knows information about the cluster, it means your clients can actually directly talk to the Swift cluster without having to implement extra libraries or have a, ha, no, uh, have a stateful knowledge of the current state of the cluster. The account server, or the, an account in Swift, is a logical division of the namespace. Generally, you're given an account in Swift when, you're, when you sign up for a cloud service or you, you use an internal Swift deployment. You, your user is generally tied to a particular Swift account. Uh, an account keeps a listing of containers, and uh, then the containers, therefore, also keep a listing of objects. The accounts and containers basically keep a listing of what's inside of them and a little bit of metadata. And then the objects are what store the data themselves. So when you're uploading an image, when you're uploading a movie, when you're putting in your, uh, your backups, that's stored in an object. And then you have a listing of that automatically tracked for you in the container. And then the con account knows how many bytes are aggregated across this entire account and things like that. So that's exposed to the user in, uh, via the way API with a simple URL. So the URL has three major components. So after you're looking at, this is just the domain I'm talking to, and here's the API version that I'm talking to, which has so far always been version one. We've had a very stable, uh, over four years uh, old uh, API. Uh, the, you've got the account and container and object. The account is the top level, the container uh, is uh, next, and then the object. If you compare this to something that's functionally similar, something like Amazon's S3, the uh, buck Amazon's uh, buckets correspond to Swift containers, and Amazon's keys can uh, correspond to uh, Swift's objects. So once we get the data, this is all that the client is going to see. Put, put this object, get this object back. And so the system itself has to know where to place that. So the question of data placement is actually pretty important in figuring out how we splay that across the cluster and protect against failures. And Swift does this by organizing or, or uh, uh, keeping information about the, um, the failure domains within the cluster. So the first failure domain that it works around are drives. The second would be servers. The third is a zone. And a zone is something that in your deployment that has a single point of failure, say a top of rack switch in a single rack, or maybe a row of racks that's tied to a single utility power supply or something like that. And then above a... Um, what we're going to talk about today with global clusters, above the zones, we've added in the concept of regions. And I'll uh, talk about that in a little bit uh, more detail. Suffice to say that Swift uses uh, consistent hashing that also has been enhanced to take into account these failure domains, such as you can easily expand and uh, shrink your capacity with no downtime. You can upgrade uh, with, with no uh, user impact and, and things like that. So overall, that's, that's kind of the background of where we're coming from and how Swift works. So then the question becomes, what's the need? How come people have been asking for three years, do you have global clusters in Swift yet? What's, what's going on here? And that question of multi-site deployments and multi-site storage is interesting when you dig down into it and figure out why do people actually want this? In a large case, this is de uh, demanded by the enterprise customers. And normally, I'm pretty allergic to the word enterprise. It's generally associated with bad stock photography of people smiling at computers. But the, when, you, when you think about it, when you change the way you think about it and see that, well, this is actually software that takes into account the entire scope of the business, then that becomes a little more interesting as figuring out what are the actual needs that we need to solve. So there's two main things that really come up. Uh, one is the fact that we need to be able to have this multi-site durability. Uh, we need to have a continuation of business story. Maybe we have, uh, we have some regulations. Maybe we're storing something that uh, we're, we're uh, legally obligated to keep, even if there is some major issue that may take out a, an entire data center. And so it's, it's very important for those people to be able to have this multi-site durability. But there's other things that are, other uh, use cases that are also very interesting that require global clusters for support. And that is the fact that networks are slow, generally because the speed of flight doesn't change. And if you're far away, it takes a long time to get it. So if you could actually get close, that's a lot better. That's the whole concept behind CDNs and caching and all of that. So 
With the other, the other major, major use case, besides the multi-site durability, is it wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be nice if I had a deployment in Europe and a deployment in India, and when I had somebody in Japan asking for it, they're actually going to India and not to Europe. Uh, that would be really nice. It's a little more localized. It gives you better throughput, lower latency, and all of that. So I said that there was a uh, company that was doing this as far as back office uh, stuff. There's a, there's a company in the United States called Concur. And they have, they have global clusters running in production today. So I wanted to tell, tell you a little bit about why they did it and what they ended up doing. Their, their business is to provide some HR services, essentially, to companies. And they have tens of thousands or more uh, customers, different individual companies. And essentially, they do things like travel booking and expense reporting. And so you come to a business trip, and you go eat lunch someplace. You get a receipt. You take a picture of the receipt, and they store it for you. And they can do some OCR scraping and figure out, oh, you ate at Joe's sandwich shop, and you spent $15. Great. Now you can easily do that, and it's really kind of nice. So their use case involves a lot of mobile devices uploading these pictures. The data itself is critical to their business, and they have legal obligations to keep it around for tax purposes for seven or ten years or more. And it's financial data and it has personally identifiable information so it's not like they're going to go upload it to a public cloud someplace. They have to keep it internally. So they were looking for a system that would do this and one of their demands because of the sensitive nature and of the data legally and uh, well, legally they had to have multiple sites separated. Now, in their case, they needed to have a couple of sites so they could easily fall over to the other one. So they needed to keep them in sync, but they didn't necessarily have to have this active-active thing. So their deployment ends up with, I've got two, uh, they've got two regions. They uh, have everything going to one region, and then it's synchronized uh, across to the other one. I'll cover how that works in a little while. Uh, and then if, if something were to happen, they can easily flip their DNS records over, uh, change their uh, application to point to the other location, and then they can have that continuation of business story. They know they haven't lost their data in that way. So that becomes a very real, important real-world use case of uh, people who are using this in production. So here's the summary of why we need this. Data is global. Um, people need local access to stuff, and the multi-site durability is actually really important for uh, key data that is essential to uh, actual businesses. So we've got this. We've got this working in production today uh, at places like Concur. And it was uh, completed in this, this summer. And then as part of the OpenStack release cycles, it was released in the Havana release. So that's all well and good. Got some pretty pictures on the slide. But how does it actually work? Let's get into the technical uh, guts of it. So there's a few basic pieces that we have as, that make up together the global clusters feature within Swift. First, we had the region tier. Uh, then we've got the ability to have separate off your replication network, because if you're traversing a WAN, you especially don't want that to impact your client traffic. You want to be able to do separate QoS on that and things like that. You want to be able to support migration from existing deployments of Swift clusters. Somebody has a single region Swift cluster, and hey, we've got this new feature. Let's actually grow into a segment region. But to do that, you've got to be able to think about, oh, how do, you, how do you adjust your replica count? Maybe you wanted to go from three to four replicas, so you know you, you, have, it, uh, uh, you have a couple replicas in each location. And then as far as the data locality story, you want to be able to make sure you have both read and write affinities so that you can uh, not be traversing the WAN needlessly. So as a summary of this, and I'll go into a couple of uh, details, uh, I'll try to talk through this about one minute long video about how this works. So what happens is, a user has a cluster. And in this case, they have a region in Portland and a region in Hong Kong. They have uh, these two regions there, and a client uh, will then upload their data into the cluster. At this point, through GeoDNS or something like that, they're going to be routed to the Portland region. They're going to have their full copies ri written, in this example, to the Portland region. So you'll see four replicas are created right here. At that point, you're going to async the client can get success, but you're going to uh, the Swift itself will asynchronously replicate two of those over to the other region. So these go over to Hong Kong. Now that first client can say, hey, guess what? I've uploaded this cat photo, because cat photos are funny, and I'm, I want you to look at it. And so send a link over here, check this out, and that person can go look at it. So he's in Europe. 
He went, he's geodns over to uh, Hong Kong and then pulls up the replica and gets the, uh, the local replica there. And that's essentially how, that's what happens, the data flow and how things work. So let's look at what's after the user experience of kind of what they're seeing there. Let's look at what the data placement actually looks like. So this is kind of what we built here. We added on that region tier. And remember, this is what we had to start with. And the important thing here is, in this one, I've got two zones. I've got a proxy server in each zone, and I've got three servers in each zone. My three replicas for my cluster are now split across so they're on unique servers, so you're still protected from that kind of failure. But uh, you'll notice they're in both zones. So what we did is we uh, added on a, the region tier for that. So that is now one level higher in that hierarchy of the data placement. So in this case, you can still see that rather than having just the two regions in one zone, great, I put four regions in two, uh, two regions, uh, sorry, four zones in two regions. And in this case, I'm still using three replicas for this example. So those three replicas are now spread across all of the regions. Now you see there's a zone that doesn't have that, but um, that's just kind of the way that Swift works. You don't, in this case, you're looking at three replicas, not four. If you had the fourth replica, the fourth one would have been in, in zone two here. So once, once, you got, once you have that, the uh, important distinction about what a region is, it's two locations with an expensive network link. And expensive can be measured a couple of different ways, but the two major ways are either high latency or maybe it's separately metered. Maybe it's not really that far away, but you really want to not do it because you're char you're, your company's charged a different rate for it. So it's important to have a, a separate replication network so you can uh, isolate that traffic more easily and do separate QoS on that. And um, the really cool thing about this is that it benefits not only global clusters, but it also benefits even single region clusters. Because now, even if you do some capacity adjustments and you add in 50% more capacity, then you know all of that back-end replication traffic to rebalance the data, to smooth it out across your newly available hardware will now actually not be the same links that are being used by the client, which means that the client's gonna be less likely to see errors because of network contention on the back end. So it's a lot easier for operators to separate that out, uh, make sure that uh, things are managed a little more uh, specifically. You had a question, Bruno. Is, a question is, anything stopping you from having a single zone per region? And the answer is no. Uh, the zones, you should only have as many zones as you actually have failure domains. And so if you have a region that has uh, one failure domain, that should just be one zone. And if we get to it, if we have time to get to it, then I'm, that's actually the example that I have in my demo. So the next thing is adjustable replica counts. I've got one region with three replicas. I want to have two regions with uh, four replicas because I want to make sure I have two two replicas in each, so I can restore from a failure from the local copy, not, in the, not the WAN copy. So three, three X replicas, that makes sense. Four X replicas, that makes sense. What in the world does three and a half replicas mean? How do you halfway replicate an object? So the way this works, actually, in Swift, you do set it to three point something replicas. And what this means is that you're gonna have three replicas for all of your data, and then 50% of your data is going to have four replicas. So if it were 3.2, all of it, 100% has three replicas, and then 20% has an extra fourth replica. And so what this really is, uh, allows is for an operator to gradually change that over time. You can imagine if you have multi-hundred ter terabyte or multi-petabyte single region deployment, duplicate it on your other region, well, you can't just, I mean, the, the, by definition, the WAN link's the expensive one, right? You can't just say, let's just replicate a petabyte of data across country. So that takes a long time. So now, and it's going to saturate your links and cause other problems. So now what's going to be, the Google guys are smiling up there. <laughs> so uh, what would happen is, in this case, the operator can move from you know, 3.1 to 3.2, or you can move over you know, just smaller increments at a time. So there's a migration path there. Multiply for whatever numbers you want, crazy Google people. Uh, so the last uh, big piece of what you, we have for uh, global clusters, the last key feature that in Toto makes up the, the, whole, the whole suite of features is the concept of read and write affinity. And in this case, we've got an example here. We have four zones. Each of them have a proxy. Each of them have several, um, several replicas. But 
you've only got three, I mean, each of them have several servers, but you've only got three replicas throughout the server. So if, for example, you have a request that then comes into zone one, then the proxy, that proxy server will return the, re for a read request, that proxy server will return the copy that is in zone one. Similar if it's zone three or zone four, it's gonna return that one rather than traversing over to a different zone. So the nice thing about this, actually, if you'll notice, this example here doesn't have regionality in it. It benefits all clusters, not just the regionality clusters, but it even benefits the regionality clusters more because you're not traversing the WAM. So if, the, if you have the case of you're going to, uh, you have a request routed to zone two, then in that case, it's gonna choose one or the other, which is just gonna fall back in equal, equal weighting on those. Uh, but the nice thing about this is we have a few ways, uh, th we have three ways to choose the affinity within Swift. Uh, the first is the default, and it's kind of what we've always had. It's a random choice between the number of replicas you have. The second one is a timing-based affinity. And what this means is that every time a proxy makes the connection, it keeps a record of how long it took to connect to that particular server. And then when a request comes in, it looks it up, and it can sort it based on those historical timings and choose the one that's fastest. And then the third one is an explicit timing, uh, explicit affinity, which says that a proxy is going to very specifically choose to get uh, sort by first, say, go to region one, go to zone four. And it's always going to do that. And you can even weight that uh, by different weights. Go to zone, region one, zone four, region one, zone two, then region two, and then just anything else. And it can, you, so you can add in a, a tiering there. So that's that's the summation of how the global clusters were built, how they, uh, how they work. So now's the fun part. Um, let's try to, does it work? Yes, it works. So let's have a little demo and see if the demo gods are with us. Um, I will apologize some, somewhat because uh, I didn't really trust the conference Wi-Fi. Um, so I'm running this all locally. So let me show you what I have here. Great. What we've got here is I've got two, two servers simulating two different regions, or I've got two regions, I guess, simula each simulated by a single VM. Each of these regions, um, you can see, let's see, uh, it's kind of wrapping there. Um, I have my ring set up here that has a, uh, the important point here is that I've got my, this, the region column is right here. You can see I've got four servers in region one and four servers in region two in this column right here. And uh, then an interesting thing is that, uh, to, to Bruno's question, they're all in, they each region only has one, one zone. So that's what we have. So what I'm going to do is I'm running all my Swift processes. So let's, uh, let's start looking at the requests. So these are, we're gonna look at the uh, proxy logs here. And I'm going, I've got an auth token already and my request uh, for my account. So I'm gonna create a container in there. And then I'm going to create an object. Now, before I create the object, I'm gonna notice uh, one thing specifically. I am talking to 56.5. So my two IP addresses are 56.5 and 56.6. Uh, 56.5 is region one, 56.5 is region two. Region one is configured so that it has a, um, it does not have a write affinity turned on. And I did this, uh, you wouldn't deploy a cluster this way, but uh, just for the examples here. Uh, they both have a, both regions have a preferential read turned on for their region. Um, and then proxy one has a write, uh, a, a, write preference, uh, no write preference, so it's gonna write it throughout the entire global state. Uh, and region two has it set so that it will write it specifically to just region two, and then the replication can, can take care of it. So I'm gonna write object one, and we're gonna see that, you know what I should have done here? Let's do this. Look at my storage logs. I'm gonna turn off replication. Forgive me, so it doesn't go faster than my typing. Okay, so I've got this, and now I'm gonna look at the storage logs, and we can see what's going on. Uh. 
OK, so I've got my storage logs turned on. Let's write that object again. And you can see here specifically that in storage, uh, storage uh, four, I have an object server put request. Storage one, I've got a, an object server put, re put request. And over here on region two, I have in uh, storage log one, I have an object server put request. So we had three write requests, just as normal. Two of them went into one region, and one of them went into the other regions, exactly what you would expect. Now, what's very interesting is let's create a different object. I'm going to create O2. I'm not really changing anything else, but in this case, I'm going to flip over to the uh, should I that? flip over to the other region, going to 56.6. So this is region two, if you remember, has the right affinity turned on. So there we go. Now you'll see that my storage requests had I had three uh, storage requests in all three of these uh, locations. The object server put on all three of these locations. Now, what happens? if I go back to object server, or the, the region one proxy server, and I request the remote object. Well, that's kind of your failure, your split brain case, what happens in that case? Oh, OC? I did OC, you said? I did, you're right, thank you very much. Good 404, oh no. Thank you. Okay, so we go here, we still get the request, no problem, we still got our data, one, two, three, four. So you can see what happens is that the object server went to, uh, let's see, where did that go? Oh, we're just looking at the object server logs. So it, it got the object server from the, from the appropriate place and everything was, oh no, there it was. It, it first did it from uh, the local region because it has that, uh, or tried that local region first. Um, couldn't find anything because it's got that read affinity from local region. So it got a 404, which meant it went to the handoff node, got a 200 from, uh, from, the, other, from the other region. And essentially, that's how it works. I mean, there's obviously a lot of details that we don't have time to go into that you would see in production as far as let's play with the replication, separate replication networks and stuff like that. But that's what I have time for today. So thank you very much. And what kind of questions do you have? Uh, so the replication, is it uh, uh, synchronous for the first replica and uh, asynchronous for the subsequent uh, replicas? I mean, if you have like 3x, for instance. Right. So what happens is that the writes within Swift are not synchronously done. Um, what happens is that the you have to have a quorum successfully write. So if if you have one region that does that, you have the write affinity turned on. It's going to write everything right there, and it's going to some of the primary locations are going to be in that region. Now the ones that are not the uh, that that region is also going to basically act as a temporary holding place for those other for those other regions, and they're going to be asynchronously replicated across the WAN after the client has already had success. Okay. So yeah, so what that actually the really nice use case on the the write affinity is that if you have a bursty workload where you're really going to spike up a lot of uh, writes and then um, have a gap of not doing anything, then it can, it can become a way to smooth out your WAN traffic. It can be something that can actually improve your throughput on writes uh, because you're not having to traverse the WAN on every single write. You can, you can basically queue that for uh, later. So when you return to the client, uh, there may be still replications happening in the background. Absolutely. So the question is, uh, when you read uh, the request, there, there may still be replication happening in the background. And absolutely that's true, but that is, that is exactly in line with the way Swift has always worked as far as doing an eventual consistency. And so if you were looking for something to, uh, if you're using your data there, you, um, the way you use the system is to acknowledge this is the characteristics of the system. So either you're only going to see that if you're doing overwrites and updates and things like that. Otherwise, you're still going to be able to get your data because it's going to go ask over the WAN. Yes, sir. Right, so the question is, is there an extra metadata layer between the proxy and the object to know about the regionality? 
And the answer is no. So what happens is that it's encoded inside of the ring, so the hash is still going, it's going to be hashed, it's going to be looked up inside of the ring to figure out what regions it's going to be there. So there's no centralized metadata lookup. Now, the other, on the other hand, uh, um, sorry, let me mirror my displays again. On the other hand, what you've got on the proxy server, for example, um, in the proxy server, you can see here, right here, that I've got my read affinity set to preferentially go to region one, zone one, with a weight of 100. I'm not doing anything else. Write affinity, I have commented out, but that's the same way you do it there. So the proxy knows what location it is in, but there is no metadata lookup to know where a, an object is because the ob it is encoded as part of the overall data placement with Swift ring. Okay, so there's just several candidates that are complete and you just draw it? Exactly. Yes, there are several candidates on where it could be, the primary replicas, and then the, the handoffs. Actually, some of the things since I've been here last, we've uh, really uh, improved the way handoffs are done, such that those are more, much more consistent over time. Yes. Regions, yes. And then do read and write affinity. You have so many combinations of where the object might be that it's not worth. So the question is, what do you do if you've got a large, large number of regions, and you you may not want to use read or write affinity on that? I would suspect you probably would not want to use write affinity on that sort of situation. Read affinity would still probably uh, help you out. Uh, but then it's also the question of, are you storing a small number of repl replicas relative to your number of regions? Or are you storing, keeping it one-to-one -one, uh, because you need that data locality? Now, something I was talking about early this, earlier this week that is going to tie in very, very nicely with the global clusters is the concept of storage policies so that you can take, you can take that combination of regionality and say, let's store it only right here or only in this other region, or we can have another storage policy that spans both. Uh, and that's, that's a subject for an entirely another talk, uh, but it's something that's coming, coming down the pike pretty quickly. So the question is, what happen, you know, how often does it have to seek into the cluster to figure out where it is and what's your, really, the, what's the worst case scenario there? What's going to happen, right? Yeah. So what happens is that the, um, it's going to first look for the primary locations, then it's going to go to the handoff locations based on the, the structure of the consistent hash ring within Swift. And yes, it's going to ask the primary locations, do you have it, 404? Do you have it, 404? Do you have it, 404? Well, maybe now we need to go into handoff locations and things like this. And it is a configurable uh, setting of how many you're going to look at, but the default is two times the number of replicas. So you're not going to say, I've got hundreds or thousands of servers, and somebody who's spoofing UUIDs at me is going to cause me to do thousands of internal requests based on their one cheap request. That's something you don't want to happen, and you definitely protect against that. How does replication cope with a failure of a node or zone? I mean, specifically, maybe not specifically, but I remember last year you were talking about when a node fails, an additional replica is made on a handoff node, right? For all new data that would have been destined for that node, yes. Right. Um, but also, didn't you have a process that would make copies of replicas that were on that machine from another machine? It w uh, not for on a per machine, but we do on a per drive basis. So if a drive fails, you're generally looking these days at you know, being conservative to expansive. You're looking at four to six terabytes of data that you can replicate. That's generally not a lot compared to your bandwidth or what actually is in an entire server. An entire server is going to be dozens and dozens. So that is, if you lose a zone, yeah. are you likely to shift all of the data across your land? No. Region? Very specifically, no. Uh, the question is, do, if you were to lose an entire zone, would you end up shipping all your data over either the LAN or WAN? And the answer is very much no. Um, the only time when we're going to automatically re-replicate data is on a single drive failing. And that is a distinctly de different and detected in different ways. Um, the, a, a server or a zone or even a region going down will not cause replication storms. Um, 
absolutely not. Yeah, that, that would be bad. Okay. Yeah? The, uh, the animated video had um, two copies of the object being across to the remote. Yes. Uh, so the question, uh, the question was, the animated video had two copies of the data going across the network. Is that really how it works, or is, was that just for the purposes of the video? Um, yes to both of those. Uh, so the, it is not specifically coordinated to say that we're going to only do one of those, move one of those replicas. However, uh, replica is pushed based on a per storage node uh, system and so it's not a synchronized state that's just there's not all funneling funneling through one queue which means that it's an extraordinarily likely that those two replicas aren't going to be going at the same time and it's also uh, fairly likely that you're going to copy one of them and then that process over there is going to be able to start doing it and and be able to replicate locally <laughs> that got some questions <laughs> some hands raised send that question. yes Not at this time, no. So the question is, is it configurable such that you can, in, you can guarantee that Swift is only going to send one copy of that data over the WAN? And the answer is no, not at this time. Feature request? <laughs> sure, I mean, I think that's an interesting feature request. Uh, the, the fun state is coordinating that state throughout the cluster uh, in, a, in an eventually consistent system is tricky. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And one is down. Yes. And now you are uploading 10,000 objects, and two hours later, this, the, 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 the other zone comes up again. Yes. So you have two zones, and you're uploading 10,000 objects, and, or X number of objects that's painful, and then the other one comes up. What happens? Yes. Right? And so w while that other region was down, you would have been choosing handoff locations in that primary re region that was still there. And at that point, uh, you will have, uh, when, when the other zone comes back online, it's going to do its replication just as it, as it always would. Uh, the good thing about that scenario is that a region going down is generally one of those, let's page an admin about this. Uh, it's going to be something that's noticed, and therefore, you, that's the advantage of the separate replication network. So you can independently throttle that throughput as needed. Or an operator can come in or some management software can come in and preferentially replicate certain things specifically rather than just letting the general replication process go. Right. Right. So yes, the most common case there being the, I mean, the definition of but yeah, this is the definition of the, of the flaky network, or the expensive network connection between the WAN. It's a more likely to go down than something internal to your data center. Keep going, great. Um, We've got about five, uh, four minutes left. Uh, so first of all, can you have, um, it, is, it literally is a full Swift cluster, or can you have like no proxies in one cluster, or, or no um, storage servers? Uh, so the question is, can you deploy this such that, or is it required that you have proxies and storage nodes everywhere in every region, or can you just have a proxy cluster and you can have some storage clusters and you can kind of mix and match how that works? And the answer is absolutely, you can mix and match. And in fact, that's something that's uh, in the concur use case. You essentially have one set of active proxies, but they are replicating over to that foreign location, which essentially is functionally just storage nodes. Uh, and so you can absolutely do that just for an archival site or, or something like that. And then to follow from that, if um, when you go to do a read and the proxy realizes it doesn't have a local copy, right. um, put it to a, a, a 302 to the place where you might try again. Or if you have like a triangle situation where there's two clusters and they're roughly close to where the user right, is, right. it'd be better to do a 302 back to the destination rather than copying it around. Of course, the right. So the question is, uh, if, if a proxy does not have a remote copy, or a local copy, then can it send a redirect back to the client and say, hey, go look over here? Uh, again, that is something that is not yet. Uh, it's, we've actually got some blueprints on those kind of that kind of functionality within Swift. 
uh, that have been hanging out a while. So I'd love to see it. I'd love to have Google contribute to uh, OpenStack Swift. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions? Well, thank you for your time. It was great to be here. If you have any questions, I'll be around.